out first. She can maybe do something with that. I'm going to go ahead and take this large beaker off the hot plate over here. Hopefully, you can see that it's boiling. Boiling water, right? So, I think it says to measure out about 15 milliliters. Now, let's see. 50 grams and 50 mil. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and pour about 50 milliliters. Now, I'm just kind of eyeballing this. What kind of a measurement is that? Quantitative or qualitative? Quantitative. Forget the difference. Quantitative is an exact measurement. Qualitative is approximation. Remember, qualitative, for those of you that wrote from Google, that's when you go out and do interviews, you get that touchy-feely kind of thing about it. That's qualitative. Okay. So touchy-feely qualitative. Oh. So the amount in here is qualitative. It's about 50. And it said, check me in the book, experiment 10-1. I've got 50 grams of sodium chloride into 50 milliliters of water. Is that summary? Experiment 10-1. I have qualitatively 50 grams of sodium chloride. How did I figure that out? I just put it on 50. I put on 50 grams and poured salt on it until the balance went the other way. Um, putting 50 grams of sodium chloride into 50 milliliters of water. It's a lot of salt, isn't it? Use a thermometer to stir that baby up. What's happening right now? We've got hot water and sodium chloride. Dissolving. Dissolving the sodium chloride. More specifically, what's happening to the sodium chloride? The water. Coming between not the molecules, but the individual ions, right? So would you kind of agree that there's it's probably dissolved as much sodium chloride as it can dissolve at this temperature. Because from today's reading, you learn that the higher the temperature, how does that affect solubility? For the same solvent, as you increase the temperature, it increases solubility. More can dissolve, right? I think we need a little bit more than that. It looks like a wimpy amount of salt water. No, I don't plan on drinking it. Throw a little bit more in there. Milk. All right, so I've got sodium chloride in water. I'm stirring it up. It's dissolving as much of the solute as it can at this temperature. So what kind of a mixture am I making? There's a name for this from the definitions that you read last night. What kind of a mixture do I have if I have as much solute as I can possibly dissolve into the solvent? Saturated. I have a saturated solution, right? Saturated. When something is saturated, somebody says, you know, I came in out of the rain, you are soaked. Sometimes they'll say, you are saturated. What does that saturated mean? You are... You're holding as much water as you can hold, right? You, you can't hold anymore. That's the idea. So in this sodium chloride, now I know that it's saturated. How can I tell visually that it's saturated? The darker it is. There's still some solid in there, right? There's some salt in here that it cannot get into the water. Basically what it means is at this temperature, all the water molecules are being used to separate the sodium and the chlorine ions, and I can't get any more of the solid into solution. And since I have more solid that's just waiting for an opportunity, but it can't do it, I know that I have a saturated solution. I have as much sodium chloride in this water as I can get at this temperature and pressure combination. Okay? Now, take that mixture. and pour it through this coffee filter 
in this funnel. So what am I what am I doing by filtering out? By sending the salt water through the filter? I'm not separating the sodium and the chloride, but I'm right. I'm making sure that none of the solids that remain get into this. So everything in here should be purely dissolved, right? There's is there a sodium chloride in here? Well, not technically. What is in here? So you've got the sodium ions and the chlorine ions and the water <coughs> molecules, right? Because the water molecules aren't breaking up. So I've got sodium. Actually, it's not going through anymore. What's that mean? Mm -hmm. Must be some solids that are somehow stopping it from moving, right? So we'll go ahead and we'll just maybe a little more pressure on the top. We'll make it more push through. Okay. So in this, in this beaker, I had a saturated solution had as much sodium chloride dissolved as possible, which meant it had the maximum amount of sodium and chlorine ions that it could hold at this temperature and pressure. Now I've just put this solution into this second beaker. Is it still saturated? I would argue that it is, right? All I've done is make sure that none of the solids followed into this beaker. But what's different about this beaker? It's temperature, right? The temperature of that water is very hot, this beaker is cold. So we've already started to have some of the reaction we're going to look for later. If you look real closely, you can see, even though I filtered it out, there are some a few, few grains of solid in there. But it's still a milky color. Just a couple of you want to take a look in there. See the amount of solids? Very little. There's a few. What's actually happening is because the beaker is cooler than the beaker over there, it's actually cooling the mixture, and the mixture is already starting to precipitate out sodium chloride. But if we start with the assumption that, okay, we had everything in here that was in here was in dissolved form. I had individual ions. I'm going to go take this and put it in the refrigerator and look at it at the end of class. What would you expect to happen? I put this in the fridge, the freezer. Now, some of you wrote your hypothesis was that at the beginning it was going to be hot water and then at the end it was going to be frozen. Um, not necessarily because there's salt in it, right? You've changed the freezing point of water by putting salt in it. It may not be frozen. Even if I left it in there overnight, it may not be frozen. But putting it in there for 20, 30 minutes, what would we anticipate would happen? I'll be back in a minute. Tell me what you think will happen. saturated solution of sodium chloride. That saturated solution is, is at a certain temperature and pressure. From your reading, what happens to solubility when temperature increases? Solubility increases, which means there can be more in it at a higher temperature than at a lower temperature. I've just put the solution into the freezer. What's happening to the temperature of the solution? It's decreasing which means it's decreasing the temperature of the solvent and it's decreasing the temperature of the dissolved solute. <clears throat> As the temperature decreases, solubility decreases. That means it can hold less. It can hold less than it already has. When it can hold less than it already has, what happens? The excess gets dropped. With sodium chloride, what does that mean? That means that a sodium and a chlorine ion are going to find each other again, come together and form a molecule. And the molecules are going to find each other and come together to form blocks of molecules, which you and I see as grains. 
Okay, so what I anticipate to happen is as that mixture cools, more and more solid salt, sodium chloride, will precipitate out of it and fall to the bottom. So when you think of that word precipitation, that was one of the vocabulary words in the reading as well. Precipitation for weather folks, weather men and women, what that means is there's a cloud, and when you say cloud cover is coming in and there's a 77% chance of precipitation, there's a 77% chance that when that cloud gets over top of you, and that cloud is gaseous water, there's a 77% chance that when it's over you, the temperature will have changed to the point that it can no longer hold the water that it can currently hold, and so it's going to have to drop some of it. And when it drops that water, depending upon the ambient air temperature, it's going to fall to the earth, and it's going to fall either as rain <coughs> or snow, or if there's an upward vector of air moving, fall as hail. Okay? So when a weather person says it's going to precipitate, it means water is going to fall out of the sky. Why? The air can no longer hold the water that it has, because when it was over a warmer piece of the earth, it could hold lots of water. But now that it's moved over a colder place, it has too much water in it and has to drop it. And that's what rain is. In the same way, that beaker that's in the freezer right now has sodium chloride in the solution, mixed in that water solvent. It can hold all of it at a certain temperature and pressure, but suddenly, when it has that amount and you chill it, suddenly it has more that it can hold, and it has to drop it. And so what's happening right now, I believe, we'll find out later for sure, is that sodium chloride is being dropped by the water, and when it drops it, it's falling to the bottom. And we're going to see that as solid salt on the bottom of the beaker when we pull it out later. Okay. The other experiment in the book, um, uses soda. So I got something I actually like. This is vanilla Coke. I figured if I could open a bottle of Coke and buy a bottle of Coke just to show you bubbles, I might as well get something that I'm willing to drink, right? So let's see. What do I need for this experiment? Well, in the book, they use the same test tube. I'm going to actually use a couple different test tubes. Um, but again, I'm going to need hot water and cooler water. I actually like to have two beaker is the same size so it doesn't throw you off. I use the desk up front here to place the beakers on. with ice water and one of them with boiling water. So it's not going to quite be boiling by the time I get to it, but it's going to be pretty hot, right? <coughs> oh, by the way, on the, this morning before class, I was talking to Ms. Piercy about chemistry. She brought it up, actually, commenting on how she had seen this documentary where, with sodium chloride, that if you put sodium on you, have a metal fire or chlorine on you, it'll eat your hand off. But if you put them together, it works on your food, right? The nature of the individual elements changes because of their coming together to form a molecule. I told her about a, a video I have where they show this experiment where they have chlorine gas. They've got a pop, popcorn popper that's popping, like an air popper. And then they flood it with chlorine gas, which will poison us, will kill you, right? And then they ignite some sodium metal. So they have a metal fire combusting the metal. It's in chlorine gas. They have this brief explosion. <laughs> and then you eat salted popcorn. Now, do you remember the, did we talk in here about the nature of ice water with ice in it? What temperature is ice water with ice in it? I saw your lips moving, I, I know you know the answer. Somebody else? What temperature is ice? When does water become ice? 32 Fahrenheit, 0 degrees Celsius, right? So if you have ice water, if the temperature is 32 degrees, if it's 
colder than 32 degrees, this would all be ice. If it was warmer than 32 degrees, this would all be liquid. So since it has water in both solid and liquid form, it's exactly 32 degrees. And will stay 32 degrees until all the ice is melted or the whole thing freezes. So you have a beaker of hot water and a beaker of cold water. Let me go ahead and open up the bubbly. Not a, not a good ch so I'm not really, I'm hopeful, but we'll see. Take okay, test tube here. Pour it over a second, of course. Ooh, look at all those bubbles. I'm gonna have to wait for a minute for the bubbles to go down. Unfortunately, those bubbles mean they're no longer in solution, are they? Why, did, why have they come out of solution now? Because of pressure difference. They were under pressure in here. You know, and you open up a bottle and you don't, you aren't careful what's gonna happen. It blows up on you, right? And you end up with it all over you or all over the car or wherever you happen to be, right? Okay. So as I look at this soda, you can see the bubbles along the sides and there's, there's carbon dioxide coming out of solution. See that? When I place it in the hot water, what do you anticipate is going to happen? Right now, we're looking, concentrating on the gaseous solute. So we have bubbling soda. We have bubbles coming out. If I place it in, well, let's start by doing this. Let me place it in the cold water. Let's let this thing chill down. That was kind of nasty. Relatively clean one. That's relatively clean. Figure if I let Ray drink out of it, it must be clean enough, right? So bubbles, <laughs> yep. Carbon dioxide coming out of solution, because carbon dioxide is the solute. The other sugar water is the solvent. What's happening to the Soda here. Can you see the bubbles underneath there at all? Let me do this. I'll try to lift them up. <laughs> on the on the cold hand, on my right hand, to your left. I have the soda carbon dioxide solution. It's in cold water and there's hardly any bubbles moving at all. Do you agree? Very, very slow motion. Over here with the, with the warm water, a lot of bubble. I, mean, I can hear it from here. What's happening? Remember we were just talking about the solid solutes with sodium chloride and how the solubility of the solid increases with temperature going up? The nature of that ability to hold more solid, in this case, is by the understanding what it means to dissolve. When we dissolve a solid, we are forcing the molecules or the ions apart, right? As we add temperature, and in the text it said temperature is another way of saying when you increase the temperature, you are adding energy. That energy, by taking the solid and having a more energetic solvent around it, actually has more opportunity and dissolves the solid more. So warmer dissolves more solid. But the nature of dissolving a gas is the opposite of dissolving a solid, remember? Dissolving a solid is more energy to separate them. Dissolving a gas is actually taking something that's pretty far apart and forcing them to come closer together. Oh. So what... <laughs> Stop throwing your stuff over there, okay? So in the gas, you're trying to bring things together. In the solids, you're trying to bring things apart. In liquids, they just need to be around each other and they just mix, it just happens. Think of it that way. So to make the, the gas stay in solution, you need to bring it in tight. And you bring it in tight by taking energy away, which is cooling. What's happening here is this test tube of soda that's in the hot water 
is very quickly becoming flat. So for those of you that prefer your soda at room temperature, when you pour it out, okay, you pour it out, you get the big fizz right away, you get the huge fizz in the bottle. Why? Because it's so warm, a lot of gas is just waiting to get out. <sighs> There's my opportunity. You've decreased the pressure, now they've got free access to come out, <sighs> and your soda goes flat very, very quickly. You take the soda and you chill it. You maybe put it in a, a cooler of ice water. Why ice water? Well, ice is 32, but so is ice water if there's still ice in it. So when you stick your hand into that cold cooler, you know it's 32 degrees, and you chill all the drinks to 32 degrees. You open up a cold drink, a cold soda, you hear the initial <laughs> because of the pressure difference, but you know what? That cold soda is gonna hold the bubbles longer because it has a higher solubility when it's cold to hold the gas in. So, warm soda goes flat fast. Cold soda holds the bubble. So not, not only is it refreshing because it's colder, but it gives you the sense of refreshment because it holds the carbon dioxide, so you get the appropriate fizz in the throat and the burn in the throat that we're all looking for. <coughs> and it happens because it's cold. Because cold holds gaseous solutes in solution. Hot holds more solid solutes in solution because they dissolve in the opposite way. All right? So are you convinced that, so this should taste flat, and relatively speaking, this should taste fizzy, relatively speaking. Hmm. Now if I put the one that was in the hot, in the cold, what's gonna happen? It's just gonna chill, right? But if I take the one that was in the cold and put it in the hot, what would you anticipate that? As it heats, it's releasing more and more bubbles. Over here, it's dead. There's nothing happening over here. Okay, so what was cold was able to hold carbon dioxide, and now that I put it into the warm beaker, it's able to release carbon dioxide. And actually, we could then take it out of here. What would happen if I took it out of here and put it back in the cold? Nothing. It would stop releasing the carbon dioxide. Put it back in the hot, start releasing the carbon dioxide again until virtually all of it was out. You have a nice flat vanilla cold Coke. So. See if I can recover any more lecture than that. Was that helpful? Yeah. Good. Sorry they missed it. You can help them out by describing it to them and hoping that uh, it makes sense. So in our notes, we are on or about middle of 355 on solubility. Just to make sure that we have these in your notes. So solubility, the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent, and they use the unit grams per hundred. Grams per hundred. So if it says it's 10 grams per hundred, that is the grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent. It's giving you a mass relationship. Okay, 100 grams, how many grams of the solute can be dissolved in those 100 grams of solvent? Again, it would be a mass relationship. And it's unique for every solvent-solute combination. That's something I want you to understand. It's unique for every solvent-solute combination. As a matter of fact, it's unique for every solvent-solute combination at given temperatures and pressures. So you can end up with a chart that shows you this solute and this solvent. The solubility is, and it's a curve. At different temperatures and pressures, what would it be? But knowing that information, if you know the temperature and the pressure, you can calculate how much solute you can put into that solvent, how much can it hold. Now, if you want to make a saturated solution, you put extra in and stir it up. 
What's happening over there when you precipitate is actually you have what's called a supersaturated solution. It's holding more than it's supposed to be able to, and that's when it starts dropping out precipitation, when it's supersaturated. So saturated for your cooling solvent. We've covered all the major points of the teaching through those labs. When you're cooling, when you have a solvent and you're cooling it, if it's a solid solute initially, as you cool it, it's going to precipitate out. And we'll get the sodium chloride in just a minute to kind of show that's happening. Precipitation, the process where a solid leaves a solution and turns back into its solid form. But again, in your mind, I want you to think of precipitation as rain clouds are dropping water. Precipitation dropped. They dropped it. What's happening over there in that beaker? Sodium chloride is being dropped by the water. It's precipitating out of the water. The idea of kinetics or thermodynamics, that when we add energy to something, we are heating it, and heating it is adding energy. That kind of idea is going to become important. We start talking about exothermic and endothermic reactions and things like that. How is it that those of you that are athletes, you have these chemicals, and you, you take the bag, right, and you rub them together, and they break the sack inside, and suddenly you've got a cold pack or a hot pack? How does that happen? It's a reaction that's taking place. You have two reactants in there, and when you take the pack and you squeeze it and break it, what you've just done is mix the two reactants. You have a reaction taking place. Some reactions give off heat, some reactions absorb heat. When you put something on your skin and it feels cold, it's stealing your body heat. It's absorbing your body heat. That's what makes it feel, feel cold. You know, when you walk up to someone and you hold their hand, if, your hand is, if their hand is cold, what does that mean? To them, your hand is warm, right? It's that same kind of thing. So when Mrs. Baker and I are sitting there looking lovingly into each other's eyes and she takes my hands and she goes, and I realize that her hands are cold, I know that she is simultaneously going, your hands are warm. Because it's an energy exchange that's taking place there. So heating a compound is, add, is another way of saying I'm adding energy to it. When I add energy to it, then all of the molecules or atoms that I'm looking at begin to move faster. More energy through heat causes kinetics to take, start them moving faster in solution. You know, think about it in the text, when you pour the, when you pour the uh, soda out, it's bubbling, it's not boiling, right? Boiling water, we think, when we see water with bubbles coming out of it, we assume it's boiling. In case of soda, you know that there's carbon dioxide in it. You've had soda plenty of times. So you know that's not boiling, it's releasing something. And that was all the premise of the experiment, that the gaseous solutions either stay in or come out of the solvents. Remember, if you think of precipitation as cooling and a solid falls out, in the, in the opposite way, cooling with a gas means it stays in or comes in. So cooling a solid solute makes it precipitate. Cooling a gaseous solute makes it stay in solution. It can hold more. Those are all summarized on table 10.2 on page 359. The phase, solid, and then what happens because of temperature? Well, if you have a solid solute, the solubility of solid solutes usually increases with increasing temperature. What is that saying? If I take it and I mix as much salt, let's say that I had salt water over there that wasn't boiling, but it was warm, and I mixed salt in it, and I stirred it up, and I got as much salt into it as I could, and then I took that solution and I heated it some more and I stirred it up. Do you see that if I heat it, more of the solid would then be able to be dissolved into the solution? So I take a, take a room temperature water with salt in it, I stir it up, and there's a certain amount that gets dissolved. I warm that temperature, I stir it some more, more is dissolved until we get to the boiling point and then that's when the maximum amount can be dissolved. The maximum amount can be pulled in. At that point, I mix it up. So then it's saturated at that high temperature. And now we're doing the reverse process by letting it sit in the freezer and precipitate out. So liquids, the solubility of a liquid is not affected by temperature. Why? If they're both liquid, they're both in that form, they already have free access to interchange with one another to move around. So there's no real effect based on temperature for liquid and liquid solutions. But the last one there, gas solutes in a liquid um, solvent 
the solubility of gases decreases with increasing temperature, which is what the soda showed us. The colder it is, the more it keeps the bubbles in. The warmer it gets, think of it this way, the warmer it gets, the more the gases inside they separate because they're getting warmer. The more they separate, the freer they want to be. The reason they're there in the first place is something drew them in. Now the warmth is giving them the energy to escape. So cold is needed to keep them in, which is the opposite of a solid, which warmth is needed to get them separated. All right, let's, let's go ahead and work through or talk through the On Your Owns then. We're on page 360, near the end. Um, you notice there on the right in the blue, those two statements are important. Increasing pressure increases the solubility of gases. We didn't have to talk about pressure, so these are the only two statements about pressure that you need to have at this point. Increasing pressure increases the solubility of gases. And pressure does not affect the solubility of liquids or solids. So just think this, pressure doesn't affect solids and liquids. Just like temperature doesn't affect liquids, pressure doesn't affect solids or liquids. But it does affect the gases. And we just saw that with the soda. What it's saying here is pressure, increasing pressure increases solubility. So if you want to use this example again, by decreasing pressure, when I have a brand new soda and I open it up for the first time, you get that sound, or maybe the can, you open it up, that sound is a sudden exchange of pressure. There's a higher pressure inside the can than in the atmosphere. When I open the can, I'm letting pressure come out of the can, right? That decreases the pressure inside, which allows the gas, the carbon dioxide, to be released because the pressure has gone down. Now more gas can come out. So when you open a soda, you get, that, you get those bubbles, that sound right there. That's a release of pressure. Now that I've released pressure, more bubbles can come out of solution. A heavy pressure holding things in works that same way. Think of it pressing down in, pressing it together. When you have high pressure, what is it doing? It's bringing the molecules closer together. That is the very nature of dissolving a gaseous solute into a liquid solvent, bringing them closer together. What well, if I get them closer together, they'll stay in solution. If they suddenly have the energy or the decreased pressure to be far apart, they'll take advantage of it and they'll escape. Okay? It's like the little kids going out for daycare. Hold the rope, right? Hold the rope. As soon as they let go of the rope, what happens? You don't know. Why? They can go anywhere. So you keep them confined. So the pressure here in the, in the bottle, in the can, whatever, is holding them in by forcing that pressure inside, keeps the bubbles in, inside. Now, there used to be a time when people that were uh, soda elitists, they had these little devices, you could buy them from Bronco or whatever, you know, late night TV kind of things. Or if you had a, uh, had a soda, they used to actually have glass bottles too, that you could take the bottle. When you were poured your soda and you go to recap it, well, it's not good enough to just recap it because there's no pressure there, and it's going to repressurize <coughs> as the bubbles come out. How can I stop the bubbles from coming out? I can repressurize it. Right? So I can put this device on there that when I'm done pouring my soda, I put it on there and I turn it on, and it forces pressure back into the bottle. It repressurizes the bottle so that it prevents any more carbon dioxide from coming out of the bottle. Because you know when you reach in the fridge and there's like that much of the two liter left, there's not going to be any bubbles in that. Why? Well, the last time they had it open, they poured it out. They had all that space above it that was at standard pressure. They capped it. Whatever bubbles were in there, they came out and they pressurized on the top. They're going to come out of solution and form a pressure until they form enough pressure to keep whatever bubbles are left in solution. The bottom's always flat. You never want the last glass out of the two-liter bottle. It's been sitting around. It's going to be flat. You know that. But this little device they put on the bottle when you're done drinking, and they'd repressurize it so that that last little bit in the bottom of the two-liter would still have bubbles in it. If it's important to you, you can probably go find it in some antiques magazine somewhere. That kind of fell out of fashion. Plus, they started putting everything in these little bottles for convenience, so you can spend twice as much for that as you can for four times as much. But it'll all have fizz because you'll finish it. That's like buying water. I gotta tell you, when I was a kid, the idea of paying for water? <laughs> That's stupid. What kind of idiot would ever do that? like everybody, right? So, stupider things have happened. Let me go ahead and get that uh, 
see what we've got for the precipitation for the sodium chloride that's in the freezer right now, and then we'll come back and do the on your own. What can you tell me about the, the liquid? Just look at the liquid. You see the precipitation at the bottom, right? Look at the liquid. You notice how much clearer the liquid is. Why? Because the fogginess that was in it was actually the sodium and the chlorine ions that we were seeing, the cloudiness. Now that those ions have come back together and formed solid and dropped to the bottom, they're no longer in suspension. They're no longer in solution. And so the water itself is clearer. It's magic. King Arthur's Court, I could be an alchemist. I'd be set for life because I can make solid out of liquid. I'm not there trying to make gold out of goose poop. Mm. I'm making sodium chloride out of solution. Mm. Okay. 10 1 on your own. A student is asked to dissolve 50 grams of potassium chloride. 50 grams of potassium chloride. Oh, potassium chromate. So what would it be? Chromate? What's dichromate? Cr207, right? So chromate is Cr04. Is that right? And its charge? Okay. If it's two negative, then what must the formula be? If this is two negative, what do I need to balance it with? Two negative, two positive. Two positive. How many are in a potassium? Two. I mean one. One. So how many do I need? So we have 50 grams of potassium chromate in 250 milliliters of water. He's having a hard time getting all of that solid to dissolve, but he's not allowed to add any more water. What should he do to try to make all 50 grams dissolve? So he can't, he can't change the amount of liquid, but he's got to get that much in solution. He can't quite get it to work. What would he do? Analogy. We still have this part of the lab over here, right? Here's my salt water. Pretend that this is not sodium chloride. Pretend this is potassium chromate. I've been asked to dissolve this much solid into this liquid, and I can't. No matter how much I stir, I can't get any more to dissolve. I'm hopeless. What should I do? Just quit and decide I am going to go start pumping gas for a living. Oh, they don't do that in this state anymore. I've got to move to the west, to the northwest, where they <coughs> don't like to pump your own gas because you might blow up. So, I'm stirring, 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 stirring. Man, I just can't get it to dissolve. I wish I could just add a lot more water, but I can't because I've been told I can't. What, what can I possibly do? I can't think of anything. Can you? Heat it up. Heat it up. Just heat it up. If I heat it up... The more I heat it, the more it can dissolve, right? I'm assuming that it's going to eventually absorb all of that at some temperature prior to boiling or blowing up. Okay, so I can heat it. I also, if I were savvy, what might I be able to do? Well, actually, no. Let's not go there. That's beyond the scope of this course. So we're just going to heat it up, right? If I heat it up, the solubility will increase because it's a solid solute. More will go into solution. Tend to. Chemistry lab is storing several bottles of a solution made by dissolving methane gas in octane, a nonpolar liquid. 
the chemist notices that every once in a while, the lids of the bottles pop off. She reasons that the lids are popping off because the gas that is dissolved in the liquid is escaping from solution. What can she do to stop the lids from popping off? Cool it. Put them in the fridge, right? Keep them cool. Why? By cooling it, you can keep gaseous solutes in solution. But the end, probably what happened is it was packaged or made at one temperature pressure. Now it's at a different temperature pressure. So, I mean, that's the other thing, too. She could cool it or she could pressurize it, right? Put it in some chamber where she can increase the, the pressure in the lab or in that room. And by pressurizing it, by increasing the pressure, that might avoid. I still think what's going to happen is if you've got a closed container with a lid on it, the first thing that's going to affect it is going to be the temperature, right? The fact that the room is pressurized, we can talk about theoretically how that could be used, but the primary way is going to be with temperature. By decreasing the temperature, you will hold the gaseous solute in solution. 10.3. A student is doing an experiment that involves dissolving a gas in water. And he notices that even though the temperature in the lab is exactly the same every day of the year, there are some days in which more gas can dissolve in water as compared to other days. What most likely is changing from day to day to affect, to cause this effect, or to produce this effect. One day a certain amount of gas will dissolve in a certain amount of water, the next day more gas will dissolve. Pressure's changing, the atmospheric pressure's changing. So when you listen to the weather, weather man or weather woman, the meteorologist on, on the news, and they say, we are under a high pressure system. Okay, there's high pressure. What does that mean? More is gonna dissolve. More gas is gonna stay in solution on a high pressure day. Why? The pressure forces more gas to stay in solution. Now we're coming into a low pressure. This front comes through and now we're in a low pressure system. Guess what? Less is going to stay in solution because the pressure is less. Gases stay in solution when they're under pressure. When they're in the bottle and it's capped, they're under pressure, they stay in solution. So every day the pressure is different. Remember we talk about air pressure. That's the pressure, that's the, ma that's the force of the air that's in a column that's on your shoulders all the way to the top of the atmosphere. When you're standing right now, you are supporting, imagine somebody standing on your shoulders and you feel that weight of them. You have the weight of a column of air all the way to the outer atmosphere on your shoulders all the time. You're just used to it. If I ask you right now, do you feel the weight on your shoulders? You're like, what, my, my fleece? My, what, what are you talking about? There's nothing on my shoulders. Yeah, there is. You're just used to it. You're used to carrying it. That's why sometimes those sci-fi movies where they have an alien come to Earth and they step out and, boom, and they're flattened on the ground. Why? Either the gravity or the air pressure. Where they come from, maybe there isn't that column that they have to support all the time. So if they're not used to that pressure, it'd be like you going to their planet, throwing on a, you know, a flak jacket or something like that. You'd feel the weight on your shoulders <coughs> because of the pressure difference. So... How many in here want to grow up and be space travelers? Is that on like your what I want to do when I grow up list? Was it ever? Oh, you guys aren't admitting it. Come on. Any questions for me through the end of today's reading then? No, tomorrow plan is to go over the homework questions and answer any questions you may come up with, come up with between now and then. All right.